Now is the time to worship the creator of heaven and earth. Now is the time to glorify his name. Now is the time to sing our hearts out. Now is the time to surrender everything and worship the one and only God. Oh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Oh, let us please stand. Let us praise the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the holy of holies, and he is the only one that's worthy to be praised. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Let's sing it out. Amen. speaking to an empty room to a camera we have people God's people in the house amen hallelujah welcome 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 for those of you watching I need you to go to your to the website miamitemple.org because Pastor Nelson is continuing our series lesson two lesson two so you need to download that PDF and the other reason why you need to go to our website is because this is a dry run with our volunteers this week, the church council is going to be meeting because the roof is done. We passed the inspections, and now the church council is going to finalize the guidelines for re-entry. But it's not going to be like it used to be. There's going to be a process. So you have to follow our website. You have to follow the emails. There will be instructions. So please, please, please keep an eye out on the website and our emails. Next week, we have a special guest. Who's our special guest? 
Man, you have you can like him or dislike him. I have to love him because he's my dad. So Roger Hernandez is going to come next week as our special guest, and he's going to give us the word lesson three, right? Lesson three. We're doing our we're continuing our series on community next steps. So this is our membership class. If you want to be a member here at Miami Temple, you're getting exposed to what it means, the expectations, our vision, and our guidelines. But welcome to our Miami Temple experience. Our worship pastor, Vanessa, is going to lead us in, in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it is such a privilege to be back together. God, the power is not in the temple itself, the fact that we're in this building, there's nothing special about brick and mortar or concrete. But what is special is that the people that are in this room are carriers of your Holy Spirit. And so we're here together, the bride worshiping the groom. And so we're thankful that you are in our midst and that you have brought us to this point through a long long year 2020 into 2021 we want to give you all the honor and glory and praise today everything that you are worthy of and more in the name of jesus we pray amen amen let's worship you're watching miami temple kids Church, Mink and Pastor are here to bring you pleasure once again and joy. Today we're talking about spiritual gifts and today I have a good old friend, Mr. Potato Head. A church is called the Body of Christ and Mr. Potato Head here represents our Body of Christ, which is our church. And we have all these parts right here, which represents us. We got the nose, the Mickey Mouse chocolate thing, feet, eyes, arms, ears, everything. If we start doing whatever we want, it's trying to stick each other wherever we want and we do what we want to, we will look like a gross mess of a potato. Wait, what? You you wanna be a, you wanna be a nose? Fine. Looks kinda weird now. Always talks back, a little sassy. Yeah, what what? You you want you wanna be feet. You're gonna hate it down here, just so you know. That, that would just be too painful. You, I don't want to hurt you. What do you want to be? You want to be a fashion model, eh? Oh, I am your father. No! Oh, what, what, what's this? Oh, suitcase. This must be the missionaries. So somebody thinks they're a mouth, but really they're an arm, and they try to put their, their, their arm in their mouth. How is he going to eat just like put put his hand on his food, and then just like absorb it through his hand. <coughs> ah, I broke his butt, and we do not want to look like this thing. The thing can't even stand up. Say, and imagine if like your nose was near your butt, like where your arm should be. No one wants to smell that. Or imagine trying to eat where, where your head is. Imagine if it was picture day. Like, just say, smile. Talking about eyes on the back of your head. So this is our church. Uh, it doesn't work that well. It's kind of messy and uncomfortable and not nice to look at. So the question here is, where do you fit in? Because, you know, a church needs its parts and every person here needs to be a red spot. And once now, I reassemble Mr. Potato Head here and make him look nice, adorable, and cute. Now we've got a positive Peter with thumbs up. That is our church, beautiful with a giant red nose. That is our church. It looks nice, it's beautiful, and our Mr. Potato Head, no, king of the church. So the question is, where do you fit in church? Are you the ears? Help us listen to God. We've got the mouth that can talk to God. Prayer, worship, and if everything like that. We need feet to travel places. Cause... And the arms that are, can do God's work. So everybody's got to find their place in the church. And no matter what, if your nose, eyes, mouth, arm, balloon, ear, crown, feet, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. All of you, 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 is a part of it. 
Like all these pieces fit with the church, everyone's a part of the church. Everyone fits in, and that's what makes us a good church. Without you, it would not be the same. Putting God first can be difficult. What can we learn from Ananias and Sapphira, who refused to put God first? Ananias and Sapphira intended to put God first. They believed in Jesus and were likely among those who had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira was that they found it difficult to keep their promises to God. They vowed to give 100% of the funds they received for the sale of their land. Now, this is a generous offer, above and beyond what God had asked. Maybe at first they felt good to make this promise. Perhaps it was the peer pressure of watching many other people sell their possessions and give it all to the apostles. However, when Ananias and Sapphira had the money in their hands, greed set in. They started to imagine all the things they could buy with that money. And what if they would lack resources for an emergency? They did not trust in God as their provider and sustainer. They trusted in money instead, making an idol from it. So they decided to tell the church that they only received a lesser amount than expected. By the end of that day, both Ananias and Sapphira were dead and buried. The question then comes, why did God treat them so harshly? Was money a sufficient reason to bring their lives to an end? You know, God is profoundly serious about honesty and integrity in all areas of life. This is as true in our tithes and offerings today as it was for Ananias and Sapphira. Even though God expects us to bring him regular offerings to his cause besides the tithe, he does not establish which proportion of our income or increase should be regularly dedicated to him. It can be equal, less, or more than the tithe. We are totally free to decide about that percentage, but God expects us to keep that promise once we make it. Others may not know what percentage we have promised or how much our income is, but God knows it all. However, don't allow the fear of failure to prevent you from experiencing the spiritual blessings that come from making your pledges to the Lord. Making vows related to what He expects us to do will strengthen our desire to accomplish His will. It will also lead us to discover where to find the strength to thrive. Without me, you can do nothing, said Jesus. In some cases, not vowing, not firmly deciding to do what is expected by God, may lead us to waver between right and wrong, opening a breach for God's enemy with severe consequences. But what if we have failed in the past? Well, there is always hope. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we ask Him, He will give us the power to fulfill our promises. And it may start happening today. Ananias and Sapphira refused to put God first. The consequences were terrible for them and the people around them. God's love compels us to put His kingdom first, while Ananias and Sapphira's example is a warning for us today. As we return our tithes and promise, we are challenged to put God first. I have a question for you. Whether you're here or watching at home, why do we do this? Why do, why do we do this? Whether we're congregating here in this place or turning on our TVs in the middle of a Saturday afternoon, why do we do this? The answer may be different for you, but for me, it's because I have a testimony. I have a testimony that there is a God who is all powerful, creator of the universe, can speak things into existence. And yes, he, he sees me, one in seven billion. That is why we're in this place, because our God, our God is awesome. Our God is great. He is our provider, our deliverer. So let us praise his holy name in this place. Can I get an amen? Let's praise this, his name in this holy place. My God is awesome. Let's sing it together.
Jesus, you are awesome, our God. This is the theme song for the month. And it was chosen because of how simple it is. It just takes after the text in Revelation where it says, all of the saints, all the angels are surrounding the throne of God and all day, every day, they are praising his name. Now we can sometimes take time in the morning while we're driving in our car, Sabbath morning, we're praising God, but they are giving what he's really worth, which is praise all day long. Everything that they speak is praising the God of heaven. Can we join them today? Can we join heaven today and sing worthy of it all?
Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. You know, now you're not preaching at it. I'm preaching to people, so you can say happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> it's different. Um, it's been 15 months of us having to preach in sections, of us um, doing the pray set one bit and the children's story in another bit, and then us, like, not knowing how people would react when we said something to a screen but now seeing everyone here, it's nice. It's nice to see everybody back here. And I know you're smiling under your mask, but I see your happy eyes. I'm very happy to see you guys over here. And we're excited. We're excited because we know that God has been good to us. Amen? Um, we are gathered together here once again because uh, God's been good. We've made it through. But we know that there's many families that have been hurting, that have been challenged. Um, but yet God still remains faithful. And our church is here standing, committed, ready to serve uh, not only the church community, but also our larger community uh, as a whole. And we're so happy that our volunteers are here and we're looking, very, we're looking forward to have uh, the rest of our church uh, and our community open and, and coming to us again once we reopen very soon in a few weeks. Um, I want to begin today by having a word of prayer for you and continuing our series that we're talking about um, in this entire month, which is the next step, which is all about understanding how God has not only made you unique, but understanding how that uniqueness can translate into life-changing, life-transforming power for you, your family, and the work and the community that you do at large in the whole world. So before we begin, I want to start with an in-person word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again for being with us today, for helping us um, to be here today uh, in person together as we are studying your word. 
So we ask, God, that you be with not only those that are here today present, that you also be with the participants that are here today, our, our, our live stream team, our worship team, our volunteers, those in the audience, but also those who are watching after the service today, those who are watching in the recording, those who will be watching years in the future. May they be blessed by today's message, and may you speak to our hearts um, as if we were watching this right now, and as if you were here speaking to us. Guide us and uh, hide us behind the cross. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our theme uh, that is, uh, if you see here on the screen, the gifted priesthood. The gifted priest is, is what we're talking about today because today I want this to be a practical message. We're going to be looking at what are some of the, uh, the ways that God has uniquely gifted you to serve his people around the world. Now, this is important for us to make a distinction of what we mean by priesthood. Um, what is the priesthood? What is the priesthood? If you remember from the Bible, there are two uh, central figures that come up whenever we talk about the, 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 the priesthood. And I'm not talking about Aaron. Now, Aaron is usually the, as you know, he's Moses' uh, brother, older brother, but he's a person that's associated with the priesthood. But if you look at the, uh, the biblical record, there are two people that are mentioned as priests before Aaron at Sinai. This is important. We're going to get to it. First, it is, uh, actually this way, this way. It's uh, Milk Jethro. He is the priest of Midian. We find him in the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, we find that Moses, when he, and if you remember the Charleston Heston movie, you know who Jethro is. Moses comes and he beats down these folks that were trying to um, take the, 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 the watering grounds of Jethro's daughters. And then he's introduced to this priest of Midian, Jethro. He is in, and he sticks around with Moses for a while because obviously he's his father-in-law. Gives him, a lot of, gives him a lot of good advice on how to be a leader and how to um, do the things that God's called him to do, but he was a, do you know what he was by profession? He was a priest, but the priest wasn't his profession. That was his role. His role was a shepherd. He was a shepherd, and he was also a priest of Midian, but from his day-to-day -day work, he was a shepherd because he and his daughters, they had uh, an empire of, of livestock in the area, and so he was known as a priest of God. But he's not the only priest that we find in the Old Testament before God calls the priesthood in Sinai. Do you know who's the second one? Even before then. There you go. We have some people. That is none other than the mysterious king of Salem. Later on, became known as Jerusalem. His name is Melchizedek. He's a priest king of Salem. He comes out in the book of Genesis. And he shows up when, um, when Abram, or that was back then, Abram, Abraham, he was about to, uh, or he had just finished conquering this big decisive battle, and he goes to this king, and he gives him a, a tithe, a tenth of everything, of the spoils of, of war, it's basically to thank God for the victory that he had given him fighting these kings. Now, the reason why this is important, this mysterious king of Melchizedek is important, is because, again, these are two, uh, oh, by the way, and what was his profession? He was a he was a king. So his, he was a ruler. He was a high on the social economic totem pole, if you will. But he was nonetheless somebody that served God's people in a very important role. And why is this important? Because, again, these both happened before the establishment of the priesthood at Mount Sinai. Most people, if you, if you were to do a survey of, of most Adventists or most Christians around the world, if you were to say, what is a priesthood? They would associate it, word association, with some sort of religious practice. Now, generally, yes, if you look at the definition, the strict definition of a priesthood, um, it is someone who intercedes before the people and a deity. Now, yeah, you may say that is a religious thing, but guess what? When God came to the Israelites at Mount Sinai, his original plan was what? Was it for just one individual person to be a priest, or was it for the entire nation to be a priest? The nation. He said, you will be for me a nation of priests. So everyone in that nation wasn't, they weren't all priests. Like that, they all did other things. You had people that were carpenters, people that were, uh, that were, that, that they were sewing things. They had, you had people all over the world. Same thing today. There are people in God's church that do lots of different things. They don't all work within the structure of their organization, the church. But nonetheless, God has called us to be priests. However, in the Old Testament, what happened was that there was a rebellion. The, the people were scared, terrified of God when he showed up. And this is a key thing, that instead of God having a nation of priests where everyone served God according to their own unique giftedness, God had to settle for priests in a nation. 
right? So instead of everyone doing their role, God had to settle for Aaron and his family, which later on became the Levites, as the only group that were the only ones that were supposed to serve God. But that's not God's intention. But if you fast forward to the New Testament, you find Jesus coming and actually establishing a a new way of things. Actually, it isn't a new as much as it is a return back to the way uh, things were supposed to be. What it says in 1 Peter, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, does this sound like the paradigm is a nation of priests or priest in a nation? If you're listening and if you're watching, if you're here, I hope this sounds like, wait, God isn't calling us to have, again, a a paradigm where it's only one or two or three people that do the work of the priesthood, of the work of the church, and then everyone else just, we do our own things, but our, our time with God is in the weekends, or it's in this one part of life. No, no, it's a return to the way that it was supposed to be, where everything we do is an outflow of our relationship with God. Remembering that as pastors, we have one part of the role to do, but our relationship with God is not any more special than relation that any of you have, or that we have attained a level of connectedness with God that is outside of what any of you can do, or what God has called you to do. We are all a nation of priests. Now, the question for us is, how do we know what our role is? Now, these are two pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, and if you were dating um, someone, you might have heard this, the, the concept of um, the one. Anybody heard of the one? Your soulmate, if you will, that's another way to say it. Um, think about the soulmate. If you, if you thought about this concept, it's, it's, if you've never heard about it, good. I hope you don't because it's a, it's a terrible illustration to try to find a, a spouse. Um, the reason for this is that the soulmate theory says that in this large ocean, in this big world, that God has one person for you, right? There's one person for you. And your job is to try to find that person, right? Now, does that cause anxiety or does that alleviate anxiety? Now, if you were in a small town of 100 people, okay, good, not that hard. But in this big world of billions of people, you have to find that one person and they're hiding from you, right? And sometimes they're play, they play hard to get. And you have to find that one person because if you don't, your whole life is screwed. It's screwed up. It's terrible because you're going to be writing the person that God never intended for you. So good luck. Terrible theology. It's a terrible concept because the reality is there is no the one. Okay? There is no such thing as one place of ministry. And if you don't find that one place of ministry, if you get it wrong, then guess what? You're done. The reality is that there are certain spheres, people that you could be compatible with. And people that you probably are not going to be compatible with. But it's not about finding the right person. It's about being the right type of person. And finding that connection with some other person. So that as you both are working to get to know each other and get to know yourselves and your habits, that you, 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 you basically, as it says in the, in the Bible, you both submit to God and you work with each other so that you make the perfect marriage rather than trying to find the perfect prepackaged set to make your life happy. You work for perfection. You don't try to find perfection in someone else. Perfection is an ongoing process. The same thing happens when it comes to understanding our calling in the the vocation or the profession that God has called us to do and what he's called us to be. A while back I heard this very fascinating concept of what it means for people to find their zone of excellence or where God has called them to be. And it's not an English concept, not a Spanish concept. It's actually a Japanese concept called ikigai. Ikigai is an interesting concept that actually combines several dis- different spheres. And in these different spheres, what we find is that there are um, four different areas in life that God has uh, gifted with. Ikigai, the word itself, means uh, the reason for being, why God has made you. So the Japanese, as they try to describe why someone was put on this earth, they try to find the blend between four different areas. One, and if you see on the screen, is you have to find what you love, what do you love to do. Combine it with what the world needs. Combine it with what you're good at, because you can love something but not be any good at it, right? Like, 
You know, I like to sing in the shower. doesn't mean I'm going to be on the praise team. You know what I'm saying? That's not the same thing. And uh, the last thing is what you can be paid for. Because, I mean, let's be honest. There's that concept of starving artists that they are, they're good at what they do. They love it, but maybe the world needs it, but no one's buying it. So you can't really make a living off of it. So if you find a combination of two things, that's nice. But unless you find, oh, there you go. I have to do this, this thing here. <laughs> unless you find that combination uh, of all of them, you might end up with maybe just a vocation. But if it's just a vocation, you might feel excitement and complacency, but a sense of uncertainty. Or if you um, are in your mission, but there's, no, there's nothing you can be paid for, you might find delight and f- fullness, but no wealth. If you are just, if your passion, uh, which is a combination of what you love and maybe what you're good at, you may be satisfied, but you might feel useless. And if you're getting paid for something that you're good at and the world needs, but it's not really what you love, you may be left with feelings of being comfortable, but you also feel a bit of emptiness because it's not really what you love to do. Maybe all of us at some point, we've felt some, uh, some way about these different types of roles that we're called to. And, and again, like I said, it's not as if, um, it's not as if there's, there's, there's a perfect um, place for it. It's, it's, it's an ongoing journey, if you will. But the, 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 the search and the push for trying to find this ikigai, this search for um, the, where God's called us to be, is, 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 is a valuable process in itself, just like the process of dating, that yes, it hurts when you don't find the right one, but the process of finding and knowing yourself will be worth it at the end when you find something that you're like, and someone that you're like, yes, I want to spend the rest of my life with that person. It's worth it. It's a, it's a, it's a journey, though. Now, where do you start? How do you figure out what that thing that you are good at, that the world needs, that you can be paid for, where do you start? Well, there is a, um, a well-known uh, Pre, uh, pre- preacher, Bishop T.D. Jakes, who said, if you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion, for your passion will lead you right into your purpose. And so when it comes to trying to find out what your, your purpose is or your passion is, there's a, there's a few different ways to find out. And today I'm going to have a couple of different exercises that you all in the audience can try out maybe when you go home. Uh, those of you that are watching on live stream or are watching in the, in the post recording of this can try out at home if you could pause the the, the message and, and start off and also give you some homework to do after our, our sermon so that that way you can kind of have something to follow up with. But I want to begin by asking you or a- having you ask these questions um, to yourself and to, to find out what your purpose is. Um, so to answer, to find the purpose to your life, answer these questions. One, spend some time writing down what is important to you. And you don't have to find, again, something that you think that I'd like to hear or what God would think you'd like. Just write down what you think is important. Two, what are you good at? What if people told you you're, you're very good at? You're an excellent, um, you're, you're great at listening to people or you're great at strategizing, you're great at coming up with plans. Whatever it is, make a list of that and that will help guide the, the process. And three, how could the world be improved? And this is good because this is a combination of, remember that ikigai concept of what the world needs. If you write down a list of what you think the world needs, it will give you a a backdrop, a list of of, uh, maybe like a a content bucket to think, okay, let me try to see if I try doing this that the world might need. Are people responding to it? Am I scratching where it itches? Is it something that people find useful, find beneficial? That will at least get you going on this. Now, another exercise which might be even better for you is to actually uh, find your purpose based on what you've done, okay? So you mostly all have jobs, or if you haven't, you've maybe had a job before, or you've maybe served as a volunteer in some place. Um, I want you to write a list of three to five different, uh, the, the last jobs that you had, because in this, in this exercise, this is a really good one to find out what are the combinations, what, what's the combination of things that you've done that you find uh, enjoyable, what you don't find enjoyable, and this will help you again to figure out maybe what God has um, ultimately for you in this search for Ikigai. So this exercise will have you writing down what you did if you were a, uh, a janitor or, or, or a teacher or served as a head for a, a division of some sort of company or whatever. Write that down as what. See how, when was it. Were you there for three months? Were you for a year? Just write that down when that was there. Um, three reasons why you enjoyed the position that you did. Uh, what, what gave it to you? And again, don't, this is for your, yourself. Why did you like it? You're not answering for anybody else. Why did you like what you did? And it can be whatever you want, but try to think 
deeply about what, what parts of the job or the role that you did were enjoyable to you. Um, then what was your favorite experience? Think through everything you did and try to, try to think of one unique experience that you had within the role that you did that stood out to you, that you, you really enjoyed, and write down what that was. I, I dare to say that as you start writing that down, for all of these different uh, jobs, because again, you're not doing it for one specific role, you're hopefully doing it for three to five, your last three to five, you'll start seeing a little bit of a pattern of what is it about these different jobs that you like so much that kind of binds all these favorite experiences together, if, you, if you're following. And then three reasons why you did not enjoy it. Like, what, what did you not enjoy about, you know, working here or there? I remember when I started doing these things, it was way easy for me to write down what I didn't enjoy about some jobs. And maybe for you, it will be the same way. But really try to think about if there, if there was anything good about the jobs that you did or the volunteer experiences you did. And finally, um, write down a grade for it. And so with the, with the idea of writing all these things down to find, is, is to try to find a common thread around all, of these different, um, around all of these different experiences, both positive and negative, to try to find out, again, as we go to the next slide, try to find out what is, at the end of it all, what is your ikigai? What is your reason for being? Why did God put you on this earth? And how can you use that combination of what, you're, what you love, what the world needs, what you're good at, and what you be paid for to serve God's people? Now, I didn't go into how you can um, leverage how to be paid for what you do. There's a whole other thing on that, but right now we don't have the time and probably not the best way to do this right now because you know, people think, oh, listen to church and find out how to get paid? Like, I don't know. We can talk about that later. Call, email us if interested. We'll do a seminar on that. Okay. Um, but here's the thing. When God called his people for, um, for ministry, when you talk about the God's priesthood, how is it that we're supposed to use our gifts and abilities together as a church to benefit the world? Well, the Bible tells us actually in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, when the apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, said this, it says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherd, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So something that Ikigai does not take into consideration is the Holy Spirit's role in this. And so this, for, for me, I find it fascinating. I feel it, find it exciting, and I find it almost like a sense of relief. Um, because, yes, there is, a comp there is ikigai for us, a combination of all these factors that I mentioned before. But that's not including what the Holy Spirit has done for you and what the Holy Spirit is doing. Again, the Holy Spirit is not like this uh, disinterested, impersonal force out there that doesn't really care about us. Like, God is working in our lives. And through the Holy Spirit, God has equipped his church, that's all of you here, that's those of us that are watching on TV, for, um, with, with gifts, unique spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives and takes as we need and as the church needs for building up the body of Christ. And as we're working together, uh, understanding our own gifts, understanding how God has uniquely gifted us, uh, we can use those gifts and talents to not only bless the church, but also the world at large. Because again, God's, God's, uh, God's calling for us is to be priests, not to use simply our gifts for the church, but to be the church outside. Does that make sense? It does say amen. Okay, good. Yeah, I expect you're hearing me. That's really nice to hear that. But... The problem with many churches is that we see the pastor and we think back to the old paradigm of priest in a nation. We think, okay, we have a pastor, or we have two, or we have three. Okay, and they're the person that take care of everything. They, I mean, I, I, I can just relax and whatever, but they're the ones that do it. And a pastor is one part of the church, one, one part that the church needs. Our churches are sick and dying because they are missing other vital parts of the leadership. When a church does not understand that we all ought to work together, you'll find that there are, there, there, there are few leaders and they're stressed trying to do a lot of work because everybody else is like, okay, let me know what you need and I'll do it. When they're like, okay, I, I'm trying to juggle a million things at once and rather than helping, I, I feel like I'm the only one doing stuff. Now, thankfully, I can say at Miami Temple, we are actually not in that situation. I, I praise God because... In this situation that we face with the pandemic, we have realized that um, what we need more than anything else is to remember to put together our spiritual gifts that God has 
um, back there, the, the, the gifts that God has given us together. And what we have here, you can't see this because you are watching on TV, but we have volunteers and their families that have answered the call of God to come and to serve. And we realize that as we are moving forward into the next uh, foreseeable future of ministry, that we need to band together. We need to use our gifts and our talents and our experiences, what we like and what we don't like, to bless not only the folks that are coming to the church, but also to bless the entire community. We've been doing this for 100 plus years, as you saw from last week's sermon, and the, the, the story is still being written, okay? So just because we did all of these things in the past doesn't mean that we can sit back on our accomplishments and be like, yay, we've we, we helped build Hylia Hospital, hooray. We helped to, you know, start GMA, and we've opened many churches in South Florida. I mean, that's, it's nice, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that, therefore, we're done. Like, there is a yet uncharted future. We are called to do bigger and better and greater things than that, right? We are called to build upon the shoulders of those who came before us. And so how do we do this is by understanding our spiritual gifts that God has given us and working together to find that. So if you go to our website right now, for those of you that are watching, uh, type in miamitemple.org, and you'll find on the splash screen, one of the first things you find is an invita invitation to take our spirit uh, spiritual gift inventory. And it's just a few short questions that you've taken. Many of you guys that are here, you've already taken it. You don't need to take it again. Um, but that, that helps you to understand what are some of the gifts that God has given you. And once that's done, this week... Um, we'll start interviewing people. So if you've already taken the spiritual gift test, you're going to be getting an email in the next few weeks. Um, we're start, well, this week or next week. We're starting this week with our ministry development council to start interviewing names that have come in for a ministry conversation. And not, I say interview, but it's not an interview. There's no failing this. Uh, the idea is to get to know you and help you to know your gifts and um, your, your talents as well. So that way we can help find this ikigai together. So the process starts by taking the spiritual gift test on our website, and we want everyone to take it because that, especially for our leaders, this is how we're going to um, be able to know where God has uniquely gifted you and how to follow up with you, even if you're in the ministry now, to know how to serve you better, okay? Thomas, uh, Henry Ford is quoted as saying, coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress, and working together is a success. Once we come together... Once we work together and once we stay together, that's going to begin the process of helping to change things. But this can only happen if we're working together in a good faith effort to understand how God has made us, understand how God has, wants to grow us, understand that by working together, as we found out in the Mr. Potato Head video, that we need to work together. We can't say, ah, oh, I don't understand what that nose does. I don't think the nose is doing a good job, but I'm an ear. My, nose is, my, my job isn't to breathe, it's to, to hear. I can't say, oh, what's the feet doing? The feet isn't doing its job. Yeah, but you're an esophagus. Like, that's not your thing. How about if you work together with them? We've been called to work as a body, not to fight with one another, but to work with each other. And for that, we need communication. And we need goodwill talking with one another. And we need to remember that at the end of the day, we're still imperfect sinners working with a perfect God. So as we're working together, recognizing that God has forgiven us of our sins, recognizing that we are called to do something great, God will do something special with broken vessels that we are. He will do it. But something important is because it's something important to understand that God may give us our talents, he may give us our gifts, he may give us our strength, but at the end of the day, what will ultimately determine success is our connection with God based on our character. Andy Stanley is quoted as saying, your talent and giftedness as a leader, have the potential to take you farther than your character can sustain you. And that ought to scare you. There have been multiple cases, and there's still cases, of people that have been very talented, very successful, but because there was an area in their life that they refused to acknowledge, refused to even recognize was even there, refused to seek any help, that they thought that their talents and their success, that was enough to take them, but didn't work on the character stuff underneath them, ruined them. Don't let that be your case. Even if you are a case where it, it is a, like, a, like, a, like a David who had a falling, it doesn't mean that's the end of the line for you either because we serve a graceful God, amen? There's never a period with God. Like don't try to write a period for God when God has put a comma in your life. But the way to find out how God has gifted you is by humbling yourself before God and asking God to reveal to you the areas of your life where you need to grow in. 
And once we do that, he will do it. It's maybe the scariest prayer you can ever ask for, for God to reveal to you what are the areas of your life that you need to grow. But once that process begins, you will find that it will be a, one of the most fulfilling, life-changing things you can do. So today, as you're watching, as you're here today, I, again, action step. If you haven't taken the spiritual gift test already, do it, please. That's gonna, we, we have, thankfully, over 70 people, 75 people that have taken it so far. We want you to, to be a part of that. And if you are interested in, in thinking about, well, how can God use my ikigai, I want you to fill out that, that form and contact us so that way we can start the process in this um, journey to find out God's role for you. But for you that have been watching us today on screen, for those of you that have been in here, we want to say thank you. We want to say uh, remember to follow us, and there's going to be something special um, for you once we come back in the building. And, you know, it's really, it's really odd. Every time I, I finish, I, I, it was to land the plane, I'd have to do closing things because it was the end. But I'm going to have a word of prayer for us to finish, and we're going to finish with, a, with our closing song. What do you say? Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for the time that you've given us, for being able to uh, help us understand what are the spiritual gifts that you've given us and how we can figure them out. Through your people, Father, we might be benefited. We can grow. We can expand. So we ask that not only those that are here, but those that are watching afterwards may be able to understand how you've uniquely gifted them so they can be a blessing to their jobs and to their schools and to their families and to the world where we are at, knowing that as we work together, we can do mighty things for you. So thank you, Father, for this day. Give us a wonderful time. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, let's sing together. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all.
the center of your church. Come on, sing with me. Jesus, be the center. 